Don Makos, and you are listening to Looking Up with Don. This is the Looking Up with Don podcast, episode number 31, for the week of August 5th, 2020. The related website for this podcast is donmacholtz.com. That is spelled D-O-N-M-A-C-H-H-O-L-Z dot com. Two H's. What's up in the sky this week? As our week begins on Wednesday, August 5th, The moon is two days after full phase and rises after the evening sky darkens. From mid-northern latitudes, moon rises only about 30 minutes later each night as the moon is moving northward rapidly. This shortens the time between moon rises each night from 50 to about 30 minutes. For the next couple of months, when the moon is near full, this pattern will be repeated. The full moon closest to the start of autumn, which is about September 23rd, is called the harvest moon because for several nights around full moon it rises only slightly later each night, providing light for the farmer who is harvesting the crops. In the springtime, as seen from the northern hemisphere, the opposite occurs and moon rise is delayed a bit as the moon moves southward, and the time span between successive moon rises each night is increased. With a bright moon rising against a dark sky early this week, this provides some good moon rise photo opportunities. Jupiter and Saturn still dominate the evening sky, as does the summer Milky Way and those comets. We will discuss those comets later in the podcast. On August 9th, the moon passes just south of the planet Mars. Mars continues to brighten as it reaches opposition on October 13th, about two months out. Venus rises about three hours before sunrise, very bright in the morning sky. Compare both the brightness and colors of Venus and Mars. Venus is three magnitudes brighter than Mars. That's about 16 times brighter. Venus is bright white in color, while Mars has an element of red or orange in it. I have observed that as Mars gets brighter, the color turns more toward yellow. In the past two weeks, the world has launched three space probes to the planet Mars. They will arrive there early next year. The path from Earth to Mars requires that the space probe speeds up so that its distance from the Sun increases. Mars is the next planet out from the Earth, and this trip takes several months. Only every couple years are the Earth and Mars lined up for such a trip. That is why the Earth residents are launching their projects at about the same time. Will you be able to see the International Space Station this week? This week we have six zones. If you live north of 45 degrees north, the ISS will not be visible this week. In fact, it will not be visible next week neither. That's you, Germany, Poland, Canada, England. No ISS for a couple weeks. From 25 through 45 degrees north, the ISS will be in your evening sky for only the first part of the week. Then it will not be visible as we near the end of the week. That is most of the United States, Japan, Turkey, Italy. Get out there early this week. If you live between 15 and 25 degrees north, You can see the International Space Station in your evening sky all week long. North Africa, Mexico, you have it this week. Between 15 degrees north and 15 degrees south, that is the equatorial region, 
you can pick it up towards the end of the week in your evening sky. Central America, that's you. Between 15 and 35 degrees south, you can begin seeing it in your morning sky toward the end of the week. Australia, parts of South America and Africa, get up early this weekend to see the International Space Station. South of 35 degrees south, it is in your morning sky all week long. New Zealand, most of Argentina, that is you. To determine where it will be in your sky, go to the website heavens-above.com and enter your location, then click on ISS. Eye Patches Let me begin this segment by saying when I got my first telescope, a 2-inch refractor, in October 1965, I went from looking at the sky with two eyes to looking at the sky with one eye. Think about that for a minute. Put your hand over one eye, and how's that working for you? Okay, you see what I mean. But the other eye, the good eye, looks through the telescope eyepiece. The question is, what to do with the unused eye? The books I read said to close the unused eye, even though that might cause some eye stress. Or, as my parents would say, what if your face got stuck in that position? Again, closing one eye would prevent stray light from entering that eye, and the brain merging it with your telescope eye, thus reducing the contrast of your telescope eye. The problem is, I can close my right eye and keep my left one open, but I'm right-eyed. I am unable to close my left eye and keep my right eye open. That is something I cannot do. So in my early days, I put my left hand up and cupped it over my left eye while looking through the telescope. That worked rather well, but that meant I could not use my left arm for balance or holding something such as a star map, eyepiece, notebook, or pencil. Shortly after I began systematic comet hunting on January 1st, 1975, I had to find a new way to block stray light from entering my left eye. My left arm would get tired, and besides, I could create more stability if I could rest my left arm on the back of my observing chair or use my left arm to push the telescope in order to scan the sky. I would like to switch arms from time to time. I had read somewhere that an eye patch might work, but had never, ever seen anyone use that for astronomy. So I went out and bought an eye patch. Refer to the free handout called Podcast 31 Eye Patch which you can get from my website, donmockholtz.com. This handout, humorous as it is, provides some solutions. The photo at the upper left was taken in about November 1975 in my backyard in Concord, California. This is the type of eye patch I have used for most of the last 45 years of comet hunting and messe marathons. After I discovered my first comet in September 1978, the November 1978 edition of the Association of Lunar and Planetary Observers had a photo of me on their front cover of their journal, and there I was, wearing an eye patch. This was the first time I'd ever seen a photo of an astronomer wearing an eye patch. I have tried some variations of this theme, During my early days, I worked as an optician making eyeglass lenses. I also made some eyepieces, including in 1979, one with a 100-degree field, but but that's off the subject. I also made an eye patch out of a lens that corrected my left eye vision, and then I used a dark sunglass blank lens to keep out the light. With this setup, while at Loma Prieta, If a car came up the road, I did not need to put on my eyeglasses. 
I could instead clearly see the headlights as the vehicle approached. And if I removed the sunglass insert, then I could see more than just the headlights. And if I closed my right eye, then I would still be dark adapted, which is different for each eye after the vehicle passed. That eye patch setup is shown in the upper right photo of the handout. Comet discoverer William Bradfield and I communicated often by letters. By the way, for inspiration, I kept a copy of one of his letters in the upper left shoulder pocket of my observing suit, and you can see that in the upper left picture. Yes, folded up in the pocket. In one of Bradfield's letters, he said he used a cardboard box to keep out stray light. So I tried that too. And it is shown in the lower left of the handout, Podcast 31, eye patch. The cardboard box works rather well. It keeps light out of your face. If you have a long nose, you do have to tilt your head a bit to get your eye to the eyepiece. Two disadvantages are that if it is windy, the telescope is more likely to blow around a bit. And because you're breathing into the box, there is some risk of fogging up the eyepiece. Wearing the eye patch, what about the right eye, the eye looking through the telescope? Some stray light can creep in from the outside. From the right eye, it can come in from the right. The result is that a light source can be reflected from the front surface of the eyepiece and will appear to be a fuzzy thing moving in the field of view like an object projected up into the sky. This can be frustrating for the comet hunter who is looking for fuzzy things. One solution is what is known as an eyepiece guard. One is shown on my handout, upper half of the photo right of center, black paper strapped to the eyepiece. One more idea to increase contrast is to paint the side of your telescope flat black. I had never understood this. Most telescope tubes are white, and this reflects light back to you as you approach the eyepiece. By 1977, I had painted a big black rectangle around the eyepiece area of my telescope. That is seen in the handout in the eyepiece guard photo and also in the lower left photo behind the box. Finally, in the photo at the lower right, next to the handsome guy standing next to the telescope, which is me, yeah, right, I redesigned the tube to bring the eyepiece closer to the diagonal to get a larger, fully illuminated field, and I painted it black. Also notice that around the eyepiece, and this is a little difficult to see, but there is an eyepiece guard to keep light from getting in from the right. And those clips attached to the black board were to hold copies of the Atlas of the Heavens field charts. That has white stars on a black background giving an additional dark foreground. One more advantage of using an eye patch is that if someone approaches you with a headlight, flashlight, or red light, or you want to look at a star chart, computer, or cell phone, simply move the eye patch over to your telescope eye to preserve dark adaptation. An eye patch makes you see less so that you can see more. Eye patches can be bought at most drugstores in the pharmacy department, or you can get them online. Mine lasts for a couple of years, then the elastic stretches out. I wear it for all comet hunting, for the Messe Marathon, and other private observing. For public star parties, I seldom used it because I simply kept my glasses on in order to focus the telescope for the average person. And, let's face it, it looks scary, like a pirate. One workaround is to buy something called a bino viewer. It takes light from your telescope and breaks it into two, one for each eye. Then, you use two identical eyepieces. 
It works well, I hear, but it does have a limited field of view. Typically, only eyepieces with one and a quarter inch diameter barrels can be used with them. And this excludes the wider field of view two inch eyepieces. The Perseid meteor shower occurs toward the end of this week, August 11th through the 13th. This is the most popular meteor shower of the year. When I lived in the foothills of Northern California, I would usually write a newspaper article each year because people were interested. When I was visiting the late great Dr. Edgar Everhart in Colorado in mid-August of 1977, he got a phone call from a Denver newspaper asking when the shower was going to peak. He looked it up in Sky and Telescope magazine and gave them the answer. When the general public thinks of a meteor shower, it is most often the Perseids. Why is that? Well, it is a northern hemisphere meteor shower during the summer, when the weather is generally clear and the temperatures are relatively warm. It is dependable. It delivers every year. The meteors are bright. It has become a social event. Get the family out or call the neighborhood together and lie out on the deck or lawn and look up and talk. Lots of talking. Most of it not about meteors at all. What's not to like? This year, the shower peaks on the morning of August 13th. But the two mornings prior and after are also good times to watch. The meteors seem to radiate from the constellation Perseus. More accurately, between the constellation of Perseus and Cassiopeia. These constellations are labeled on Podcast 31, Map 1. Notice that at the evening twilight, this area is just beginning to rise above the northeastern horizon. During the evening hours, Perseid meteors can still be observed, but they are earth-grazing meteors hitting our atmosphere at a shallow angle, often creating long paths across the sky. Such meteors will be few because the radiant is low, but they are spectacular. As the evening progresses, the radiant rises higher in the sky the number of meteors will increase. The best place to look is to the north, the east, and overhead. So this year, let's discuss two nights. The evening of Tuesday, August 11th, overnight to Wednesday, August 12th. And then the evening of Wednesday, August 12th, overnight to the morning of August 13th. August 11th to 12th. As the sky darkens in the evening, look for the earth-grazing meteors. It might also be a good time to see the comets in the northwestern sky and the two major planets, Jupiter and Saturn, in the southeastern sky. But the main focus will be the Perseid meteors. You will have a dark sky for about three to four hours after the sky darkens. Then the moon will rise in the northeast. The moon will be half-phase, 45% full, just past third quarter. And the moon is only about 45 degrees from the radiant, and you cannot do anything about that. But at that point, I suggest you look away from the moon and face the north or overhead, and also position yourself so that the moon does not shine directly on you. As the night progresses, the number of meteors will increase, reaching a maximum in the final hour before dawn when the radiant is overhead. As the moon climbs higher, I suggest facing the north or west to watch for meteors. This keeps you away from the moon's light. The following night, August 12th to 13th, the same as the night before, except that the moon rises about 30 to 40 minutes later, so you'll have more time of dark sky before moonrise. Also, the moon will be only 35% full, so it will not be as bright as the night before. Plus, this is the morning of the most intense peak of the meteor shower. 
As the moon rises, face overhead or north, and as the moon climbs higher, I suggest facing northwest or even east if you can block the moon from shining directly on you. Assuming that besides the moon's light, you have fairly dark skies, you, you may be able to see 30 or 40 meteors per hour in the final morning hours of each of those two mornings. Next year, 2021, the moon will be in the evening sky and set before the meteor shower becomes active, so next year will be better than this year. The following year, 2022, there is a full moon, and that will make meteor observing very difficult. The meteors come from Comet Swift-Tuttle, discovered in 1862. It was determined back then that it should be back in about 120 years. Therefore, it was expected to ter- return around 1980, but it did not. The late Dr. Brian Marsden recalculated the orbit and predicted it would return in 1992, and that was when it returned. When it did, it was redesignated 109P slash Swift Tuttle. And aside, as a visual comet hunter, I learned that this comet may be coming back, and so I plotted where it would be in the sky upon its return. From time to time, I would specifically sweep that area looking for it. But more often than that, its expected location was already included in the areas I was covering as part of my systematic comet hunting program because I was covering much of the sky each month anyway. Well, it wasn't me who picked it up. In September 1992, it was picked up by Japanese astronomer and comet hunter Sorinko Kuruchi. It was found in the northern polar region of the sky. He had visually discovered a couple of comets in 1990 using six-inch binoculars. Periodic comet Swift-Tuttle has a large nucleus about 15 miles across. This comet was seen as long ago as 322 B.C., It's due back in 2126. So get out there and see the Perseids this week. Now let's talk about comets. The positions in right ascension and declination for all five comets mentioned this week are available on Podcast 27, Comet Positions. All five comets are also shown on Podcast 31, Map 1. Comet 2P Enki is magnitude 11 in dimming. Periodic comet 88P Hau is magnitude 10 in slowly brightening. Now for the other three comets. Here we go to Podcast 31, Map 2, which you can download free from my website. Here we see the movement of three comets. Comet 2017 T2 Pan Stars, magnitude 10. Comet 2019 U6 Lemon, magnitude 10. And Comet 2020 F3 Neowise, magnitude 6. Last week, Comet Lemon and Pan Stars passed each other. This week, we have another close approach. From August 10th through the 13th for several nights, Comet Pan-Stars at magnitude 10 will be within 3 degrees of Comet Neowise, magnitude 6. Meanwhile, Comet Lemon, magnitude 10, will be 12 degrees to the north, very close to the star Arcturus. This is a good photo opportunity. Three comets, not needing a telescope, but a good long exposure of a few minutes are several shorter exposures stacked together. Prior to that, on August 5th, Comet Neowise passes near the globular cluster M53 on its way to meet Comet Panstars. Let's learn a new constellation. It is called Aquila, and it is identified on Podcast 31, Star Map 1 and Star Map 3. 
Presently, it is high in the east as darkness falls. Aquila represents an eagle with the bright star Altair, 16 light years away at its head, two wings, one to the east and one to the west, and a tail made of three stars. The Milky Way runs through this constellation, and Pioneer 11 is headed in this direction. Under dark skies, you'll see both bright and dark star clouds in this region. Near the south end of the constellation Aquila is a fabulous open star cluster known as M11. It is also known as the wild duck cluster due to the V-shaped arrangement of stars, and it is identified on Podcast 31, Map 3. In binoculars, it appears as a fuzzy patch. You may not see any individual stars. It is a very rich cluster, with at least 700 stars and perhaps as many as 3,000 stars, and it's about 5,500 light years away. Its magnitude is about 6, and it is about 20 arc minutes across. It was discovered by Godfrey Kirk in 1681. After looking at M11, sweep around this area. Look at all the stars. Through the telescope, M11 takes on an awesome appearance. But I have observed that the appearance of M11 depends upon the light gathering power and magnification of the telescope. Smaller ones, 3 through 6 inches with low power, show a compressed bunch of stars. Impressive. But even better is a larger telescope at 100 power or more. In the center of the cluster, the stars may appear as divided into several groups. Take some time viewing this cluster. You won't be disappointed. Incidentally, Kirk, who discovered M11, was the first person to visually discover a comet through a telescope on November 14, 1680. 340 years ago. The age of visually discovering comets through a telescope is nearing an end. I'll be talking more about visual comet discoveries in future podcasts. You have been listening to Looking Up with Don, podcast episode 31 for August 5th, 2020. I'm Don Mockles. Once again, the related website for this podcast is donmacholtz.com That is spelled D-O-N M-A-C H-H-O-L-Z Two H's God willing and pod willing I'll be back next week for another episode of Looking Up with Don We will discuss what is going on in the sky We'll continue observations of the comets in the evening sky We'll learn a new constellation, one of the smallest constellations, and I'll talk about the Astronomical League. Thank you for listening. See the sky this week. I'll see you next week.